Um, well, thanks very much for doing this. I mean, it, it is only, uh, uh, it's not that long since we last talked to you, I think beginning of September, but yeah. actually um, a lot's been going on since then. Um, and I suppose if we start with this slide, that this, um, this is an incredible stat, really. And the share price up 73% since you took it on. Yeah, versus, uh, versus the market of 40, actually, as well. So, yeah, yeah. so ne ne nearly double the market since we took it over. So, yeah, it <laughs> started well. Exactly. And there were so many people kind of writing off kind of value when, when at that sort of time when, you, when you're taking on the fund. Yes. It's, it's quite um, a big switch. So um, talk us a bit through uh, what the fund's trying to achieve, please, to start off with. And then um, we'll, we'll sort of start picking up questions, if we can, from the audience. Yeah, okay. Um, so probably the most important thing that the board did, well, you, a lot of people will remember the fund used to be run by um, Al Mundy, who was a very well-known value investor. I think probably the most important thing that the board did was stick with value investing um, by appointing myself and Nick Purvis. Um, because I think that's, that's what a lot of people own the trust for, and I think that's what they should own the trust for. I think it, it's worth just um, reminding people, if you, uh, if you dig out your copy of uh, Dimpson, Marsh and Staunton, or Farmer and French, or any of those sorts of studies, uh, they will say that over the long term, there are only three factors which work, and those three factors are size, momentum, and value. And they, they actually will tell you that growth doesn't work, and they will tell you that quality doesn't work. Um, and I know that, you know, that that will surprise a lot of people uh, because um, those those factors have worked just recently. Um, and I think I think it's, it's, it's important to sort of think about why those factors have worked and what's going on now. So if you go go forward, um, James, to page three. Here we go. So the last decade, we have basically had conditions that we, which were very favorable for uh, what you might call long duration assets and, and growth stock to long duration assets. Um, and specifically in the last sort of two years, you know, we took those, those policies of zero interest rates and quantitative easing. We basically took them and put them on steroids. So the Federal Reserve in 18 months did printed $4 trillion. That was the same as they printed in the previous 115 years. Um, and obviously lots of other central banks were doing that. And it turns out when you, uh, when you throw that amount of liquidity at the market, you, you achieve some pretty amazing things. So March 20 to March 21, you know, we saw, we saw NASDAQ up 100%, Scottish Mortgage Trust up 200%, um, uh, the ARK Innovation up 350%, Bitcoin up 1,200%, Tesla up 1,200%. You get the picture. Um, and it, it just, just I suppose, looking at this chart here, um, just, just to give you an indication of how frothy things got. Top left, the inflows into US equity funds in 2021 were the same as the previous 19 years of inflows added together. You know, that is pretty frothy. Top right, this is a valuation indicator of the US stock market. So, some, some people listening might have read the, uh, the Jeremy Grantham piece, Let the Rumpus Begin. He, he, he basically identifies the US stock market today as the sixth super bubble in history and the point he makes is that it's significantly more expensive than it got to in either 1929 or, or 2000 that you can see that in the chart um top right the bottom right bottom right specifically uh, the technology sector got super frothy uh, this is a valuation ratio of the uh, software sector in the u.s and we can see that right at the top of tmt that very briefly touched 10 times so you're trading at 10 times EV to sales, and from there you lost 80% of your value. Look what happened last year. We got to over 18 times EV to sales. So we got to nearly double the ratio that we got to in 2000. So, um, you know, pr pr pretty um, pretty frothy uh, situation. Go, go to the next slide. And, you know, we've, we've always said that there was only one thing re really which would ever end those... Um, uh, central bank policies and it was going to be inflation um, and obviously we had this debate last year about well what was inflation transitory or not I think you know now we're seeing these figures come through the highest inflation rates in 40 years I mean the, the, the chart bottom right is just extraordinary so in some countries in Europe PPI is over 30 p 30 percent uh, you know that, that is not a typo Italy is seeing PPI running at 33 percent at the moment so so just extraordinary levels of inflation 
coming through. And belatedly, the uh, the dear old central banks have been have been forced to admit that uh, actually inflation is not transitory, and they are going to have to do something about it. So, oh, so actually, sorry, James, go 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 to the next slide. Just uh, just one additional point on inflation. The the inflation picture was already already bad, and then of course this happened. This being Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and, and, and we can see on the left. Russia is not a particularly big economy. It's, it's actually a, a, as an economy, it's smaller than Texas. Um, but what you can see, if you look at the um, some of the bars on that left-hand chart, they are a very big producer of certain commodities. And effectively, what you've done is just take, you know, 10, 11, 12 percent out of the production um, of of those commodities into what was already a very tight situation. So, so look at look at some of the price rises. On the right hand side there we've got you know some some of the major commodities and just just lots and lots of them up over 100 percent in the last 12 months i think we all know don't we our, our gas bills are going up 50 percent today so that inflation picture is 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 you know is is bad it's not going away and central banks are, are reacting go on to the next one and so the, the, the market is now expecting central banks um to put rates up uh, that's be, that's beginning to be reflected so I was reading today that apparently the first quarter was one of the worst performances for bonds in in history in the in the US. Um, so so that you know the market is reacting uh, by by obviously selling off bonds. It's also reacting by by starting to rotate out of some of those stocks which did, which did so well in the old regime. So uh, you know top right there we can see the sort of sell off in in technology stocks. Amazingly, even before Christmas. 40% uh, of the NASDAQ stocks had halved from their peak. That's the chart bottom left. Um, what, what's really interesting this year is that actually that sell off has spread to some of the large names. So if you look at the, the chart bottom right, you know, I, th I guess we're all aware of companies like um, uh, Facebook, now known as Meta, which fell 26% in a day. Uh, and um, uh, PayPal did the same, fell 26% in a day and as half. So, you know, we're now getting some very significant drawdowns in uh, in um, some of those technology stocks. So it, it really does feel like the market is is rotating away from growth and back into value. Go on to the next one. And just, just sticking with this um, topic of inflation, um, we really think the value has got a part to play in your portfolio in an inflationary environment. And our evidence for saying that comes from a note which was done by a chap called James Montier, who I'm sure you know, now works at um, GMO. And he wrote a note last year and it was called What to Do in the Case of Sustained Inflation. Now, interestingly, at that point in time, James didn't think there was going to be inflation. Um, but actually, the, he, sort, he sort of said that's irrelevant because he said, you know, my, my, my job is to try to make my portfolio robust against a range of outcomes. And if one of those outcomes is inflation. I, I, I need to position myself for that. So what he did was he went back to the 1970s and he he basically looked at what did well and what did badly during the 70s, which, of course, was the last period we had um, a period of sustained inflation. And this is the, the, the chart top left is taken from that. A um, couple of interesting observations here. US equities, which is the dark line, did okay. So by the end of the decade, you'd basically just kept up with CPI, which is the light grey line. Um, however, if you look closely, uh, 72 to 74, as I'm sure lots of people will, uh, will will have read about or maybe even remember, you had a 50% drawdown. So, so that was a pretty painful period. And of course, you needed the fortitude to, to stick with it. Interestingly, though, he did say you could have done significantly better than that if you'd bought value, because what you were doing by what you're doing by buying equities is effectively you're buying an inflation hedge because equities is a real asset class. But by buying value, you, you're buying a cheap inflation hedge. And he really he, he identified if you look at the light blue line there, you can see U.S. value did substantially better than the U.S. equity market throughout this period. Um, and there were two reasons for that. Number one, U.S. value was very cheap going into that decade. Number two, um, you've got to think about the sectors within U.S. value. The sectors within U.S. value are things like energy, mining, etc. So they were the industries that did well um, uh, during that period. And, and, and we would say that both of those things are relevant today. We would argue that value is is um, is very cheap today, and we would also say that uh, you know we our fund at Temple Bar in particular is very very exposed to areas like energy and mining. Just an, another chart that we've actually added ourselves is time and time and time again. I hear people say. Um, that actually all you've got to do to, to sort of get through this period of high inflation is, is, is stick with uh, 
quality stocks or sometimes people will call them quality growth stocks um and so actually we thought it'd be interesting to look at, at you know what how, how do those types of companies perform in the 1970s and the answer is they were a complete catastrophe um i mean by, by the end of 1979 you, you were below your 1974 point in absolute terms not just in, not just in real terms um so and, and why? Because, you know, again, just like today, the valuations on those companies were, were very, very high and they just spent the decade um, de-racing. And we think we think that's a real risk for people sitting, um, you know, in, in these sort of quality growth companies today. And just if you, if you look at the chart, uh, sorry, the table bottom right here again, you can see how the um, how the market has started to rotate into the more value areas of the market. So the, this often surprises people, actually. The, the best performing sector in the last year is energy. Um, mining is kind of buried within materials, but if you broke it out, that's the second best performing sector. And then financials is the third best performing sector. So again, again sort of, you know, evidence of that rotation. I'm just going to finish with a, a, a sort of a couple more slides. Um, James, and I'll canter through these quite quickly. Go on, go on to page uh, eight. Page eight is, the, I suppose, this is just uh, you know, in in a world in which we've just said the U.S. stock market is kind of more expensive than it was in twenty nine and two thousand. Uh, the U the U K is the cheapest it's been for fifty years. It, it went out to a forty five percent discount to MSCI World. Interestingly, it's one of the best performing markets this year. Um, so actually, it has outperformed a little bit, but you know, you're now at forty percent discount. So. UK is very cheap. Can you go to page uh, 11 now, James? This is just, uh, I think this is quite interesting. Um, di dividends used to be really, uh, really sought after in the UK in particular. Uh, dividend funds used to, you know, used to represent big parts of people's portfolios. And then, then of course, we moved to that wonderful environment in which, you know, you could just rely on the market going up 20% per annum and Therefore, you could just sell some of your capital gains and, and, and who on earth needs dividends in that sort of environment. But, you know, maybe if we're moving into an environment where, where you can't do that, maybe dividends are going to become popular once again. And, and if they are, the UK is a good place to start because the UK yields over 4% today, even if you strip out the commodity sectors versus about 1% uh, for the US. So I, I think that's interesting. Um, go on to maybe page, the next page, page 12. Again, this is just telling that you, the UK is a defensive market. You know, if you are concerned about the, the kind of volatility there is out there at the moment and central bank policy mistakes and things like that, you know, it, it's what's interesting is that the UK um, has the highest probability of outperforming when MSCI world is negative. It, it tends to be a defensive market. And I'm, ju I'm just going to finish off with a couple of slides on the um, on the trust. So if you could go to page 15. So this is this is the sector exposure of the um, of the trust, and and you know no, no surprises here. So en energy about sort of 17, 18 percent materials, another twelve. So that's mining. Uh, we hold three miners. We hold Anglo's, and we hold two gold miners, Barrick and Newmont. Um, so that's thirty percent of the fund in in those two sectors, and, and roughly another twenty in financials. You've got nearly half the fund in the en energy, materials, and financials. And just to remind you, you know those th th those other sectors shown on one of the charts earlier on which tend to do the best in a rising rate environment um so uh, you know ho hopefully no surprises there if you go on to go on to page in the next page page 16 we'll just have a look at the top 10 of the portfolio and let, let, you know let me just make a couple I, I, I guess a cu couple of general points the first one is that if you do the um the average weighted PE of the portfolio at the moment, it comes out at eight and a half. Um, Nick and I have both been running money for over 30 years, about 32 years. Um, we have rarely ever, ever seen that sort of valuation, you know, in our careers is just extraordinary. Um, let me, um, let, let me take you through, so I suppose a couple of examples to, because we really do think there is some, some, some just extraordinary undervaluation in the market today in, in which you know other areas of the market are very very overvalued so let, let's start with the um let's start with the energy companies briefly um the the energy companies will not they will give you um scenarios of the amount of cash flow that they will generate at various different oil prices and to you know 
to, normally the top the top oil price scenario they use is 70 we you know we've recently traded as high as 130 with today we're about 105 i think um but at 70 on on their current on the, on the current market caps these things are on 15 percent free cash flow yield so what does that mean the, the free cash flow they generate after their interest interest tax and capital expenditure including all the cap expenditure going into you know renewables um divided by the market caps gets you about to about 15 percent but that's at 70. at the current oil price these things are on over 20 percent free cash flow yields and rather than throw that money sort of at, at sort of you know stupid uh, expansion or acquisitions or anything like that they're basically returning it to their shareholders so most of the energy companies that we own we're getting paybacks this year of over 10 percent. that's when you add the ordinary dividends to the um, to the share buyback, you're getting over 10% returns. And of course, when you're on 20% free cash flow yields, you, you could do even more than that. Um, let me give you another couple of examples. R Royal Mail, we, we, we find just extraordinary. Um, Royal Mail is, is, is one of our, we, we had um, uh, a bunch of companies within the portfolio that we used to talk about as, as the in for freeze. In other words, these were companies where one part of the business was um was worth more than the market cap of the entire group and royal mail is certainly one of those so uh, royal mail, royal mail owns a um a european parcels business called gls uh we think that gls on its own is probably worth about four billion pounds and by the way that's val valuing it very very conservatively the market cap of the whole royal mail group today is 3.2 billion so the the uk business is in for negative 800 million at the moment by the way, UK business made about 340 million of profits last year. So I'm, I'm really, I'm pretty convinced it's not worth negative. Um, think about it another way. The, the, the PE now actually is, is, is about five. The, the dividend yield, and this is just on the ordinary, is, is about 8%. But they're paying you a special as well, which that gets you up to about sort of 13%. And then a buy, uh, they're doing a share buyback as well. That gets you up to nearly 20%. So you're getting nearly 20% return. To you the shareholder this year you know ju ju just just extraordinary um marks and spencer another one of these ones that which falls into the in for free category um you know I, I won't maybe go through too much detail but 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 broadly if you add up the value of their um their food retail business uh which actually is doing very very well now their food retail business post the Ocado deal is doing very well um, and you add on their Ocado stake again. You get to the um, you get to the the market cap of the group. So in other words, you're paying nothing for clothing and home. And some people might think, well, you know, maybe it is worth nothing. But actually, clothing and home has started to really, really improve. Um, th th they are now, believe it or not, the the second biggest online clothes retailer in the UK after Next Directory. They they have really made a big push to go online. So, you know, just, just again, another example of the sort of extreme undervaluation we're seeing in the market. Um, I think I think probably I will I will leave it there, James, and sort of, you know, throw it open for any questions. The, 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 I suppose the, you know, the conclusion of what I'm trying to say is that we think, number one, that the, the macro conditions which drove that enormous bull market in growth stocks technology stocks in particular is going away as central banks are forced to increase interest rates and cut quantitative easing and, and, and we think that is leading to a regime change in which people are going to um, feel the need to allocate away from growth and back to value and specifically to sectors like um, energy uh, and materials and financials and i suppose this, the, the second point is is just this one about the, the, the types of undervaluation in a, in a market in which it's pretty hard let's be honest to find value anywhere whether it's whether it's in the equity market the bond market or, or or wherever you know we 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 are finding you know just the the, the largest largest value that we've seen for for years so we, so we, we're pretty optimistic about the conditions at the moment okay that's really cool um start with a, a kind of big question so um why would value be an inflation hedge uh aren't these the sorts of companies that don't have pricing power is the quote is the question yeah it's a, it's, it's a good one and I, I suppose part part of the answer is um back to that when, when we were looking at that chart that chart from james montier um you know equities are equities are a real asset class that ergo you'd expect them to keep up with inflation um 
value is a cheap uh, inflation hedge and and particularly when you're when you're when you're buying a stock let you know let, let's let's take that let's go back to royal mail where i was saying that you're you potentially getting a 20 percent payout that 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 is going to help you to cover your your inflation isn't it when you're buying things that cheaply so that's point number one point number two is just this this one about the you've got to think about the sectors you know the the, the large the sectors the, 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 where the profits are going up at the moment, surprise, surprise, energy, mining, things like that, where commodity prices are just going absolutely through the roof. Um, you know, those are the big, big components, certainly, of our portfolio. Um, and so, 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 so those are the sectors which are doing quite well. So just coming back to the pricing power thing, we, because actually, it's, it's, uh, this is quite an interesting one, because I hear this a lot, actually. People will say, you know, oh, I hold um, Unilever and Nestle and companies like that because they've got pricing power. We... Um, when they reported their fourth quarter results a um, few, few weeks ago, we, we went through all those companies and we looked at the um, basically the top line versus the cost of sales. And in nearly all cases, the top line is going up about 3% and the cost of sales is going up about 15%. So as things stand at the moment, that pricing power is not, not very evident to me. Um, in the, you know, they do not appear to be, to be passing through those prices and you are paying mid twenties PEs for them. So, you know, there, there you're paying very high valuations and it's not obvious to me actually that you are, you, you, that, that, that pricing power is evident at the moment. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Okay, cool. Um, now just thinking about the UK, uh, there, there's there's lots of arguments. I mean, this this was talking about Brexit again, but um, there, there's an argument that inflation might be more of a problem here than than other parts of the world. And also, given what's happening with taxes and everything else, that, and energy prices, that we might more like to have a recession. Do you think that's a reason to to um, to be wary of the UK? Well, it, I mean, so, so specifically, we're talking about UK economy there, aren't we? Um, yeah. And, you, you, you know, yes, possibly. I, 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 you know, I, 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 I don't really know. I suppose all I would say is when, when you look at most of those companies um, that, you're, that we're looking at there in the top 10, not many of them are um, domestics, you know, domestically focused. So um, Marx is, Royal Mail is. Um, and that's about it really isn't it um so 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 the majority majority of those stocks are international stocks um the ones that which are domestically focused um i i would say that that scenario of a uk recession is priced in you know th that that is why royal mail's on a p5 and a dividend yield of nine at the moment um is because people have already decided there's going to be a uk recession and they have basically factored that into those types of stocks um in which case we would argue that it's probably not that much downside in them uh, if it, you know, if, if it's already priced in. Okay, thanks. Um, according to your fact sheet, apparently there's there's about nine percent cash on the balance sheet at the end of February. Um, does that sort of is that sort of normal? Or that's interesting. Um, oh no, I, I know exactly why that is. Um, but basically, because we, you know, the the the, the trust historically has issued debt. And a few a few weeks ago, um, either either by luck or, or more than a few weeks ago, so but before that fact sheet was done, um, either by luck or by good judgment, myself and Nick began to feel a little bit nervous about how things were going, and we decided to cut the um, gearing to zero. And obviously, the way that to do that is to raise cash against the debt that the trust is holding. So that that's what that's showing you. So if you net the two off, basically, it's, it's, that's just telling you that the gearing is zero at the moment. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and, all, obviously, and obviously, in the last few weeks, that's been a, a good thing. Um, dividends. So, yeah. so the dividend was cut when you took it on. Um, do you think that the the dividend is going to be sort of climbing back to sort of previous levels from here, or? or um, I'd, I'd, the... Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd hope so. I mean, the 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 dividend twenty nineteen which was obviously the last year before we entered into COVID was 52p and down to 39, 38 and a half in 2020 up to 39 and a half in 2021. And we would hope that it will grow again in, in, in 2022. Um, obviously we've had to use the revenue reserve for a couple of years as, as profits have begun to recover. Actually the dividend is becoming, um, 
it, more, more covered by the underlying cash flows of the stocks that we hold. Um, I suppose just thinking think, thinking about things like the the energy companies, we 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 you know we're seeing very very significant dividend growth, and we're seeing sort of um, you know special dividends coming through from a lot of these things. So yes, I, I would say that the the dividend outlook at the moment is um, is pretty positive. Um, that we are we are seeing dividends coming back now. You know. You know, if if the world's going into a big recession, maybe that picture changes. But 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 uh, but as we stand right now, the, the the picture is pretty good actually. Do you think you might be able to grow dividends in line with inflation over the long term? Oh, I'd hope so. Yeah, I'd, re I'd really hope so. I mean, if um, Nick and I Nick and I have a fund that we've run for for twenty years actually continuously. We ran it at Schroders, and we uh, have moved to RWC when we uh, moved to RWC. Um, and it, it, it's, its returns are very good. It, it's done sort of 420 over that period versus 180 for the market. But half of its returns have come from the dividend account, half, but roughly half from the dividend and half from dividend growth. So, um, yeah, d dividend growth is always an important component of our returns. Cool. OK, can you delve a bit more into the energy stocks, the Shell BP Total? Please. Yeah. In terms of, I suppose the question is just asking, you know, what's the, what's your thinking? But maybe talk a bit about sort of carbon, um, climate change type stuff. And yeah, could could, could we just let me just go and look? I actually want to use a couple of charts. So uh, could you go to page seventeen? So it's actually, it's the one after this. Just go forward cool. one. Okay, so very very quickly um when nick and i are thinking about um industries like energy um th this is the framework that we use it's, it, it's referred to as the capital cycle there's nothing particularly complicated about it it simply says that in capital intensive industries wh which have very long lead times you you tend to get this cycle and this is what we're looking at we're trying to show on the left hand side here which is at some point in time returns will be high in that industry and when returns are high, two things happen. Number one is that the uh, it will attract new entrants who get attracted by those high returns. And the other thing that happens, this is slightly more sophisticated, is that investors, with this, this is the chart on the right-hand side, have this horrible habit of extrapolating things forward. So when returns are high, they, they'll, they'll kind of assume they're going to stay high. And when they're low, they'll assume they're going to stay low. And what that means for the people within the industry is if you put a pound of capital down, the stock market will it value it at two pounds or three pounds and so put those two things together you've got new entrants coming in you've got um people existing players being incentivized to to invest and eventually you end up with oversupply and uh, oversupply then leads to falling prices falling returns until eventually you get to the bottom of the cycle and the bottom of the cycle people go bust people start taking capital out and and so the cycle begins again go on to the go on to the next page Okay, so this is really interesting. You know, we would say that where you want to be is basically industries where they're, they're at the bottom of that cycle, where the capital has been coming out, and therefore you're beginning that, that period of sort of the return starting to improve. And if you look at the grey line here, this is, this is the capital expenditure of commodity producers. And you can see how in 2013 was roughly the, the last peak of the commodity cycle. And you can see the big boom that there was going into it. You can see how CapEx went up dramatically going into it. And then look, what, look what's happened for the last decade. They, they have taken you know, gargantuan amounts of capital out. Just as an aside, look at the blue line. The blue line is the uh, CapEx of the technology sectors. I think as we all know, you know, anyone with a business plan in the technology space can get funding at the moment because it's, it's just the hot area. Trouble with that is that lots of capital goes into the industry and, and, and we know what typically happens after that. Go on to the next one and we'll talk more specifically about energy. OK, so so again, just th just just thinking about this, um, this, this kind of capital cycle approach. So the the chart on the top left hand side here, the grey shaded area is the um, is the capital expenditure of the largest 44 um, quoted energy companies. And again, just look where the peak was. 2013, they are spending nearly 600 billion per annum. Uh, roll forward to today, they're spending about 200 billion per annum. Th there were two things going on there. One was um, 
the fact that we were spending too much in 2013. That was the top of the cycle. They did the right thing by taking capital out. But the other one, you know, we all know about was because there was a big push by sort of politicians and asset managers and, and so on and so forth to uh, reduce carbon emissions. These companies were told to stop investing in fossil fuels, and that's exactly what they did. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether actually there was any thinking went on, but 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 somehow I think people expected demand to sort of fall in line with supply. And if you look at the chart on the top right hand side, there that wasn't what happened at all. We you know we we just we didn't stop driving cars, flying planes. You know, in industry uses um, fossil fuels, so demand rough, stayed at roughly 100 million barrels a day. Um, supply has been dramatically cut. So even before the Russia Ukraine situation, we already had a situation where one one oil consultancy that we follow says that in the fourth quarter of this year, um, demand will be th the same as the basically the total pumping capacity of the world's industry. Even in the 1970s, that wasn't the case. We've never had the market that tight and and that's why oil was already 90 before this situation the, the russia ukraine situation developed we go to the um uh, chart bottom left Th this is really interesting because with my with my capital cycle chart what you know what 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 was meant to happen is that high commodity prices and high profits attracts um new investment and that's not happening here. Um, what the way this chart works is that the the dark blue, sorry, the, the sort of black patch is basically the planned capital expenditure of the largest oil companies. The the blue wedge above it is J.P. Morgan's estimate of what we need to spend if we're going to keep the supply and demand in balance. And actually, they've upgraded. It says there the missing missing six hundred million. They've upgraded that now. They think now they they now think there's eight hundred billion. So the industry needs to spend 800 billion more just to keep supply and demand in in balance um and the, the, you know, going, going back to my point it's not the industry is not spending that money so so at the moment it looks like you know we are going to continue to have a situation where we, we, just, we have underinvested in the industry and i'm, I'm afraid uh, energy prices are going to remain high and i think um you know obviously we've got a 50 percent rise in our utility bills today we've got another 50 percent one coming at, at the end of the year it, it's hard to see that picture changing and unless unless politicians and and actually to be honest the asset management industry begins to change their attitude and says to these companies right you have got to start you know exploring in the north so you've got to go back to fracking and so on and so forth and just just to sort of finish this picture off i mentioned when i was talking about the top 10 i mentioned that um these companies are trading on 20% free cash flow yields. And then I said that they were they were basically paying that money out. So rather than investing, as we've, as we've just seen on the chart on the left-hand side, what they're doing is they're just paying it back to their shareholders. You're getting, as you can see there, you're getting anything between sort of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12% payouts when you add together the dividend yield and the buyback yield um, from these companies, which is, um, I, 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 I would say, pretty attractive. Yeah, great. Actually, that's that's quite a good um, round up for that. Thinking now about financials. Yeah. Um, obviously, rates going up is is good news for for margins for banks, which is yeah. one of the reasons why they've been doing much better. Um, what if actually we we get through this period and then we sort of re reassert a kind of deflationary period again? Is, do you think that's possible? And and if that happens, will banks just go go back the way, back the other way again? It's possible. I, th I think the, the the bigger worry for me actually is if the central banks really decide to very aggressively um, raise rates uh, and they really overdo it and and basically push us into a, a sharp recession, then you get to that situation where don't you? You know, a, a slight raise in rates is good for the banks. A very aggressive raise in rates is not because eventually that's when you get to. You know, unemployment starts to rise, people defaulting on their mortgages and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the only thing I, I would say, or I would say two things. Num number one, the, the banks today are just completely different beasts to the banks in 2007. You know, not, not only are the management teams totally different, much, much more conservative. You have much higher quality loan books. The capital ratios, obviously, because the regulators have um, have. Uh, you know, spent a decade clamping down on them. Um, the capital ratios are 
much, much better. So to give you an example, NatWest Bank has a tier one ratio, 18% at the moment. It targets 13%. So at the moment, they would say they are overcapitalized. And that's why you might have read about them buying back shares from the UK government this week. That's why they're doing that, because they, they think at the moment they are they're overcapitalized. So that's point number one, that the, the balance sheet's much better. Um, point number two is that, again, valuations are still pretty cheap. So um, things like uh, Standards, Barclays are back trading on about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 times tangible book, despite the fact that all the companies have, ret uh, have targets to uh, make return on equity of over 10%. And, if, and you know, if, and if they, you know, they're not far from making those. If they do make those, they should at least be trading on book, one would have thought. Um, and they're not, they're trading on, uh, you know, they're trading on about half times book. Nat, Nat West, a little bit higher than that, but still we, we would argue undervalued. And, and, and as I just mentioned, you know, potentially you, you, you could see a big return of value from them. Um, what's in the bond segment here? The bond segment, I think, is the, I think that is the bonds that the trust has issued. The trust has issued two oh, okay. bonds. So it's, it's, it's not bonds that we own. It's, it's the bonds that the trust has issued. Right. Fair enough. That makes sense. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, and then just lastly, maybe on Royal Mail, going back yeah. to that again. If they, why don't they just spin out the um, European parcels business? And if they did, what, what sort of value do you think the market would put on it? Um, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think they should <laughs> because, um, okay, let, let me give you some figures. Last year, GLS made 360 million sterling. Okay, so, so I've, got, I've converted the euro into the sterling. Let, let, let's put that on 10 times. Okay, that gets you to 3.6 billion just for that business. I mean, we, you know, if, if one, if one to, were to use a slight, you know, I'm, I'm using 10 times, 10 times is a pretty, is a pretty conservative multiple there that I'm using. Uh, to, you know, to give you an example, Morrison's just went out on 20 times. Um, but, but okay, let's be conservative. You know, the, we would say that the valuation of it is probably worth between 3.6. We, we actually value it at about 4 billion ourselves because we, we, we obviously put a bit of growth in. Um, and the whole Royal Mail Group is trading on 3.2 billion. So yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and another um, interesting twist here is that there is a big shareholder, a chap called Daniel Kratinsky. Who, he, he's known as the Czech Sphinx. He recently bought a, um, a stake in West Ham Football Club. Uh, and he, he owns, he, he basically is a very, very astute, very long-term investor. He owns 20%. And, you know, ev every time you see weakness in the Royal Mail share price, he just steps in and, and, and buys more of it. Um, so, you know, it, who knows? It wouldn't surprise me if, uh, if Mr. Kratinsky was uh, having those sorts of conversations with the board of Royal Mail as well. Cool. All right. I think that's great, actually. Thanks, Ian. I think that's a, quite a good roundup of, of where things are with that. Um, Pleasure. So we, we will follow you with interest, as usual. I think we've got a, a note to write fairly soon, so we'll be writing something too. Um, but uh, we'll be back to talk to you again in a year or so, maybe. So, um, let's run through those. I should put that up for a bit. So, and um, this is what we are in terms of what we've got lined up. So if we can get a hold of Andrew Mahati, and he'll be on next week, um, along with Christina Woon, who was um, one of the managers of the Aberdeen Asian Income Fund, uh, working alongside um, Q. And um, then we've got Good Friday, so we've got a, a break, and then uh, we're going to Aberdeen West American on uh, 22nd of April. And then we've got a, a lineup, as you see there, going forward. So thanks very much for tuning in today. And um, hope you all have a good week. And we shall see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.